Hello all and welcome to today. Uh, yes, good to be with you. And uh, as we continue our journey uh, from our message earlier, uh, leading into ministry today, we're going to be looking at uh, fishers of men. Uh, before, we, before we do so, let's just uh, share uh, this time with the Lord and invite him into our space. In, uh, Jesus, uh, we bring you into the space. We thank you for the love that you uh, have for us, Lord, and for what you reveal through your word and your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just ask that uh, this message is uh, filled with love and that will help people be guided into your truth and allow them to be great fishers and uh, fishermen and fisherwomen uh, that will allow so many people to hear your good news. So we give this time to you and the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so yes, we uh, discussed earlier that... Uh, there was that leading into ministry and how um, Jesus uh, spoke to certain people. He modeled some uh, mirror images that happened in the Old Testament with regards to wisdom and water, as well as uh, being sensitive during these times with regards to different religions, different ethnic groups, different culture groups. Uh, all these things are very important for us to appreciate that uh, God is working in and through all circumstances. And uh, it's for us to be able to see what he's saying and doing during this season, but holding him and others with care and love as we continue with our journey. So, fishers of men. Let's have a, a chat about that and let's explore the scriptures with regards to that. And the first passage of scripture we're going to open up in is Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And it talks about how uh, he moved to uh, Cap uh, Capernaum. And as he was moving to Capernaum, he started his Galilean ministry. And if we pick it up from verses 13 of chapter 4 of Matthew, it says, Now, uh, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he was still drawing the people, saying, repent, come back into the kingdom. You know, uh, see things from above, not below. Renew your mind, hear about the good news, hear about the principles of what God had done and said throughout his history, because it is his story. But as we continue going into our journey, we can have a look at a couple of things. He's calling us. Let's have a look at a kingdom dynamic, which speaks of the call or our call. Again, this has got to do with reconciliation. Our first assignment in the Ministry of Reconciliation is to answer God's call for repentance regarding our own separatism. Left to our own devices, we tend towards self-centeredness and chaos. But coming to God in the spirit of humble repentance opens up a way for peace and reconciliation to flow. Then we may focus on helping people to be reconciled to God and with others as well. All as a result of the cross. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit being at work in our lives. Phew, what a great opening statement. How we can, how we can appreciate what he's done for us. And then looking back in the accounts of his word, how he helped so, so many people throughout history and gave them direction, gave them wisdom, gave them knowledge and understanding, but also gave them the Holy Spirit, which is the greatest gift of all. The western shores of Galilee was the location of uh, uh, Capernaum and it was on the border of 12 ancient tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. Jesus' arrival there fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 8 verses 21 through to chapter 9 verses 2 and that these northern tribes which had suffered severely would be delivered from their enemies. And the verb is at hand means to have arrived or to uh, be here. And this suggests, uh, suggests the inauguration of the reign of God 
still awaiting its consummation. Let's have a look at uh, how some self-centeredness can cause some chaos. And in Jeremiah chapter 17, yesterday or the, I put through a uh, message of Jeremiah as well as Ezekiel uh, talking about being a watchman and warning them. And Jeremiah, as we know, was one that uh, was a weeping prophet and he had a message to bring to people out of great care and concern for them and for their families. And he didn't do this out of self-centeredness, but let's have a look at what Jeremiah chapter 17 tells us. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9. And I'll let you read all the other uh, verses regarding to Judah's sin and punishment. But the main point that I want to bring out is uh, verses 8 and 9. For he shall be, shall, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heart, when the heat comes, but its leaves will be will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And then the verse that is shared here is that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Remember the account of how God looks at the heart, where man looks at the outward appearance. And it may seem that according to men, that uh, there's uh, certain wickedness going on in the world. And as through the scripture, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's that inner self which thinks and feels and acts and uh, it's central to man. It's central to man. And we all have to go through this process of cleansing our hearts because we have emotions. It's a natural thing that every single human being created by God uh, has. And if not standing on the rock, uh, or even if we are standing on the rock, we may come against these things which may, you know, um, make us feel, think, act in certain ways, which may be uh, through anger, through hurt, through uh, sadness, through loss. But remember the fruits of the Spirit that uh, we've been learning about. And we're going to continue going into those to help us be equipped and uh, allow Him to do that good work in and through us so that we may be able to come into a place of uh, ease and rest. But it is a process that allows us to renew our mind and think of things above, not below. Another one which is taken from uh, Romans, Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read uh, a little passage here, Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 32. Now, this was talking about God's wrath on unrighteousness, and he brings that about uh, in this account, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuses. Because they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile. In their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. What does futile mean? Strong's Accordance 3154, it says to make empty, vain, foolish, useless, confused. The word describes the perverted logic and idolatrous presumption that those who do not honor God or show him any gratitude for his blessings on humanity. And then it goes on to say, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of incorruptible God into the image made by, made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Then you can continue to read how sometimes these uh, things that come about by um, man want to alter what God has created or destroy what God has created. This is what he's talking about. They had no concern or um, honor for uh, the Creator, our living uh, Heavenly Father. So he then went through those processes of not just punishing uh, Judah, but also the wrath of God came against the unrighteousness of the land. What does that bring us to? 
that brings us to a place of realization that if he's done it before, he can do it again. But it's not God's intention to be uh, bringing the judgment that he does warn about. He wants us to come back into that place of repentance. He wants us to be able to come into that place of humility and that place of being able to appreciate that uh, he's, he's got it. We're all in his hands. Yes, we do need to take a stand for those that we love and for those that we care for, whether it's our own family, our communities, our businesses, our congregation, even as far as those who are in authority, to, to warn them, to say, please, this is going to cause judgment. The consequences of the actions that are going against God's will and destroying his people as well his, as his creation will cause consequences. So the message is a warning saying, come back and repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. 2 Chronicles. Let me just go there quickly. Um, 2 Chronicles. Chronicles talks about how we do that and how it was spoken about uh, way back in the day uh, before Christ even walked the earth. And this was a message, you know, to all, all concerned. And uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verses 14 gives us an indication. And it was God's appearance, second appearance to Solomon. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour, to devour the land, or send pestilences amongst my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from them and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's a, a revival prayer for all ages that we can appreciate, not only for the historical time of what happened in the book of Chronicles, but also today. It allows us to come back into his presence. And as with uh, the uh, Israelites, when they went through their period of judges, they went through the cycle of uh, you know, doing wicked things, being oppressed, uh, calling out for help. And being delivered. It was that cycle that, that that happened. When Joshua took them into the land, they had to conquer the land. But then they went through those cycles. That's the important message that when we are going into our baptism and when we're going into our walk with the Lord, it's so, so important for all of us, myself included, to get our hearts right. So that when we go into the promised land, as Joshua took his people into the promised land, they set up the memorials. But they, they still had that battle. They still had to overcome the giants. But how they overcome the giants was dependent on how they viewed God and their circumstances, as well as the provision that God would provide for them during those times. But remember the book of Daniel, how he said he would not bow his knee to Baal. We know that every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we continue to pray into these things that this may become uh, true. The truth in all people's lives. Verses 14, talking about my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear from them and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. This verse reveals in principle a revival prayer applicable to God's people in any age. The context flows so, uh, follows Solomon's uh, dedicatory prayer for the temple. One that focuses the responsibility of any people to seek God for mercy after sin has brought its desolation, plague and judgments. This verse summarizes God's chosen way of restoration, which is through the prayers of his people and God for prayers for revival in all places. Number one, let's humble ourselves rather than God doing it to us. Number two, pray for a fuller revelation of God's glory to his people. In other words, seek his face. Matthew chapter 6 verses 33. Turn from everything that contradicts the spirit and direction of our prayers, which calls us to true repentance. And the promised result is that God will hear this prayer, will cleanse from sin and will bring healing where it is needed. For the church, for the nation and for the people. 
there's certain things that we all do that we feel that is just the best thing that uh, will help, uh, you know, uh, share the gospel, get people equipped, make a difference in the areas or nations. And as we've discussed last week, it's how we build on that uh, foundation. It's how we build on that foundation because we're all part of his spiritual house, whether we recognize it yet or not. But it's for us to be equipped so that when we bring others into the kingdom, we know that we can guide them into these passages, into these truths, and into the life that Jesus has for them. To be reconciled with God. Let's go to Colossians. This is an important message. So please, just hear me here. This is very, very important. This is, this, this is where I pray that the revelation will be revealed to you. Is Sometimes we understand things from the natural. We've been conditioned. We've been uh, told how to, uh, or how, you know, how, to, how to do things or what to do and what not to do. But where is our anchor coming back to? Where are we getting the confirmation from? Are we getting it from a new source? Are we getting it from a friend or a family? God created us uniquely, individually, perfectly. He knew us in our mother's womb. And that's what we want to preserve. That's what we want to protect. It's not only the mother's womb so that future generations can prosper, but it's the church that we want to make sure is still glorifying God in all things. To be reconciled in Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verses, I'll read from verses 17 and go through to 20. Uh, or 16, it says, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him are all things that consist and he is the head of the body and the first uh, and the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence i want to read a verse to you out of that those few verses and i want to repeat it to you and he is before all things and in him all things consist he holds everything together he holds everything together that allows us to be able to be united in Christ and allows Christ to deal and work and uh, empower us for the good works that he has set uh, for us. But why am I pointing at this particular scripture right now? Our body, our DNA is wired for love. We've covered this many times in our sessions in the past. But there's also another important element is that there's a human in, in our body that is uh, representing Christ. It's a cross. And if you go and uh, Google that, and well, not Google, maybe that might not be the most reliable source to get true, true information. If you go and research how Christ is in us through our DNA and through the human, it's a, a thing that we all have inside of us that holds things together. And when something comes in and destroys that, they're destroying our immune system and destroying our life in Christ. This is the plan of the enemy. As Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll build it in three days. And they laughed at him thinking that it was a physical structure. We've been through this many times before. It's our body that's the temple of God. And I'd encourage you to spend some time just uh, doing some research into that because it pleases the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. If there's ever a message that's going to reconcile, bring us back into harmony with our Savior, our Creator, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's that one, one of many, but that's one of the verses. 
And that's a verse that allows us to be able to appreciate the, the fruit and the work that God is doing in our lives as a result of the cross. I want to read another one, which is uh, Christ's blood satisfies holiness, thereby making peace. Mankind was separated from God because of sin and had no acceptable offering to satisfy the demands of God's holy nature. God sent Christ to provide an acceptable sacrifice for sin, establishing a bond with those who received him, thereby making peace. It was specifically the blood of Jesus Christ that shed on the cross that signified the demand of God's holiness, established a peace bond or covenant with those who received him, and provided the means for all of creation to be reconciled to God. Leviticus 17 verses 11 declares that sin cannot be forgiven without the shedding of blood, because sin takes life, and life is required to repay its sin's debts. Jesus Christ gave divine life in blood to satisfy all of mankind's sins and debts, and to restore covenantal peace between God and man. As I've mentioned before, we all fall short to the glory of God, but it's God that works in all things for His purposes and divine will. For all those that are called, loved and called according to His purposes, He works in and through all things. That laminin protein that holds us together that I mentioned through the scripture of Colossians 1 verses 17 is something that's unique and something that's special to each and every single one of us. And it's for us as individuals to protect that. No one else can have any say over our uh, temple, even though there are uh, calls to do so. But you are created in the image of God. And it is God that dwells inside each and every one of us. Remember the verse 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Can we now start to realize and appreciate what, he, what that meant and what they said about that? It's restoration. It's all away, always about restoration. But we've got to be willing. And even if we have compromised our, our, our temple, our body in any way, <laughs> He can do a good work in each and every single one of us. Ask me. Because I was a sinner. I was one that fell so short to the glory of God through all things that was destroying his living temple. And as a result, I had to uh, give my, m myself the realization that I was going the wrong way. But it is God that can restore even those cellular structures within our body. And the proteins that are holding all things together. Because when we receive Christ back into our lives, it is Him that will be inside of us and doing that good work. Bringing us back to wholeness, back to freedom, back to health. Anyway, the next one that I want to go through is uh, the four that became the fishes of men. And if we go to Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 22, we can appreciate some truths there too. Uh, so let's have a read. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on there, from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And in the boat with the Zebedee, their father, mending the nets, he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Having already met Jesus, they had already had some sort of relationship with Jesus, but uh, they'd left their secular, their, their, their secular world and occupation to follow him. And then that was when he did that journey with them. It wasn't just an overnight journey. It was a, it was a, a period of uh, chronos time that allowed them to understand the nature of God, the goodness of God, and how we may be able to have that unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness that he modeled for us so, so many years ago. Mark 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 16 uh, to 20. It also refers to some accounts. It speaks of he walked again by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew's brother casting the net into the sea and were fishermen. And again, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. 
They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who was also in the boat mending the nets. And immediately they called for them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. What does is, what is left mean? It means to pound, to go away from, to send. And three main categories meanings to let go, send away, remit, forgive. And in this sense, the word is used to connect with divorce. And especially sins. As well as to permit or neglect, forsake or leave alone. There's a lot of scriptures there that you could refer to. But I'm going to go on a couple of things is that when we are separated from the love of God uh, we are alienated we need to come back into a place of wholeness and we do that by turning as I said earlier that's that message of change of heart change of mind and as in the book of Hosea and so 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 many other accounts in the Bible is that he wants to draw people back to him To let go, send away, remit, forgive is used in connection, as I said, with the divorce. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 11 to 13. Speaking of how you can keep, or or the, the topic of keeping marriage vows. And in verses 11 it says, But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled, to her husband and a husband is not to divorce his wife but to the rest I say not the Lord if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him let him not divorce her and a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her let her not divorce him that's speaking of that reconciliation Reconciled word wealth from Strong's Accordance 2644 to change, exchange, re-establish, restore relationships, make things right, remove an enmity. Five times the word refers to God's reconciling us to himself through life, death and resurrection of his son Jesus Christ. Whether speaking of God and man or husband and wife, katalasao, describes the re-establishing of a a proper, loving, interpersonal relationship which has been broken or disrupted. I'm going to just mention on a couple of things. We've got the interruption of maybe what we have done to our own temple. We've got the interruption of our eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we've got that interruption and separation in our relationships, whether it's marriage or friendships or business uh, colleagues or, or whatever it may be. And when we are restored back to Him, as I mentioned, the health may improve and may not improve. It's for God's will and for God to work in and through all things. Just as much as it is His will to work in and through our relationships here on earth. But our most important one is the vertical one, that we can be restored back to the Father so that we can hear what He's saying. But it says here that whether speaking of God and man or husband and wife, Katalaso describes the rela- the rela- the re-establishing of a proper, loving, interpersonal relationship which has been broken or disrupted. So my encouragement for all out there who are going through this uh, separation or um, considering turning back and uh, coming to that that, uh, restoration with our Lord is just to hold fast and hold fast to the Word of God, hold fast to the anchor and hold fast to His love that He has for us because He is eternal. He knows things way his, his ways are much higher than our ways. We don't, we don't know. But if we remain faithful, he will be, he's always faithful. But he will then prove to you how faithful he is. Speaks of sin, uh, debts. Matthew chapter 18 speaks of this in verses 27. When they spoke of the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. This uh, parable was speaking of how one was forgiven. And when he was forgiven, he went and uh, looked for his, uh, whoever it was, and wanted to uh, 
enslave them until they had paid the last debt. And Jesus was saying, remember what I did for you? Now I'm having compassion on you. Now go and have compassion on others. Let them be reconciled. Matthew 9 speaks of uh, sins. In Matthew 9 verses uh, 2. Jesus forgives and heals the paralytic. No, sorry, the debts. Uh, sorry, sins. Jesus forgives and heals the, the paralytic. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 2, he says, Behold, they brought him to a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith and said to the par paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. This is now that restoration process. It deals with, uh, it, it deals with the unforgiveness. It deals with the debts. It deals with the sins. 1 John. I'm covering quite a few scriptures. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I will put this at, uh, at the messages for you to go and look at again. 1 John verses 1 to 9 um, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That allows that great opening. So once we've gone through that repentance, that uh, asking for forgiveness, caring for those that uh, may have harmed us or we may have harmed, that open, uh, opens up that door of opportunity to be reconciled, to be restored. Even though there was that separation of uh, the accounts in the word so many times, there was also the debts that were forgiven. Not a financial only debt. It was the debt of the sin that was paid for on the cross, as well as the sins that we bore, or he bore for us. Now let's have a look at another one, which goes on into the second point, after looking at to, uh, uh, these, these different things regarding separation and divorce. Number two is the permission, to permit. Matthew chapter 3, verses 15, I'll just go through some highlighting points that you can read, read on speaks of how John baptized Jesus. And Jesus was without sin, but he knew that he had to go through that process to be able to have that Holy Spirit come upon him. Matthew chapter 5, verses 40, talks about how we are to uh, walk with a brother or sister, going that second mile, but also if there's a place where death is imminent or there's a warning against uh, danger, we are to warn them, we are to hopefully restore them, bring them away from that harm that may cause. And Matthew chapter 19 verses 14 is one definitely worth reading, especially during this time. And in Matthew chapter 19 verses 14, uh, Jesus blessed the little children. And the little children were brought to him, and he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked him. But Jesus said, let these children, these little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if there's ever a warning from our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, there it is right there. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's for each and every one of us to protect the children, whether they are our own children or others' children, from any harm that may come against them. They are wired for love. They are wired for God's eternal purposes. And it's never too late to return, to hear the warning, and to protect. Number three is to neglect, forsake, or leave alone. And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 11, where we heard and uh, learnt about how Satan tempted Jesus, as well as Mark chapter 7, verses 8, tells us that sometimes the fire comes from within. And Luke chapter 13, verses 35, where Jesus lamented over Jerusalem. And John chapter 4, verses 3, speaking of the Samaritan woman meeting her Messiah, which we discovered earlier. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through to 11. Speaks of the, again... The fishermen. And in this context, the best time for fishing was at night. And Peter's doubts about Jesus' fishing abilities progressed 
to doubt about himself. Lesson there for us. When we doubt what the Lord can do, we start doubting the situation that we may find ourselves in. But first, the doubt is overcome by a miracle. And second, it is overcome by a promise. If we can hold on to those things, we can see the miracles that he's doing. We can see the signs and wonders that he's showing, if we're not the skeptics. And he's showing his miracles, and then he's giving us that promise. He's showing us, and he's going to get, allow us to overcome through a promise. The Greek word for catch means to capture alive and is a continuous action, not a once-off. So it's catching those people away from all those things that could hurt them, destroy them. And from now on, in this passage, Peter and others are continually capturing people for the kingdom of God. <laughs> That's the fishes of men. That's the fishes of men. Then we also learn about the demonic healed on the Sabbath day in Capernaum. In Mark chapter 1, verses 1, 21 to 28, speaks of this. And Jesus cast out an unclean spirit. And Jesus' initial ministry, following the appointment of his disciples, is a deliverance of a man. A man with an unclean spirit. As he launches into his ministry, Jesus is confronted by the realm of the darkness. Jesus taught independently without appealing to previous authorities. Both substance and manner of the Lord's teaching offered him that of the official interpretations of the law. And many dismissed the realities of demons or unclean spirits, and they suggested that Jesus was uh, accommodating their beliefs without bothering to change them. But it was through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he didn't even have to say a word, and those unclean spirits and demons were released from those that he was with. However, biblical records make it clear that both writers and, and of Scripture and Jesus accepted the reality of demons, realizing, as in Ephesians 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, blood but against the principalities, the darkness of, of this age. And Jesus used his authority over, as a sign, over them as a sign that he had brought the kingdom of God near. So in other words, this was the sign that they left his presence with a different mindset, with a kingdom mindset, and with one that would be able to receive the word from God. He also gave his followers authority over the evil spirits. In ancient world, it was believed that one could gain control over another by speaking in the name of that person. Demons attempting to gain authority over Jesus. That was the example. So when we cast out, or when we pray, or when we... Uh, intercede for, for healing we do so in jesus name because he is the healer and he is the restorer and he has authority over demons but it also speaks of how we are sometimes to be quiet to be muzzled because he doesn't seek testimony from demons and i just had a personal experience in this case because of things that comes against us and how quickly the Lord can restore us and drive out those demons, even through the re revelation of Scripture. You know, the negative word, the unbelieving word, or the historical uh, 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 thing that happened to us once in our lives. And then when you go back to Scripture, go back to the anchor, if you connected into his vine, he may reveal it straight away. It might take a couple of weeks or months, but in this case, it was revealed straight away. Is that It's that unbelieving word. It's that negative report that even myself was prone to. But it's standing in the, in the authority of Jesus that says, get out, you're not welcome here. Because it is the temple that we are protecting. So whether it's the mind, whether it's the heart, or whether it's the body penetrating the skin, these are all part of his temple. And as we start closing off, we've uh, got another 10 minutes or so. When Jesus casts out the unclean spirit in Luke chapter 4. Let's have a look at that. Luke chapter 4 verses 31, 31 to 37. And they went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogues there was a man who had received a spirit of unclean demons. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. 
what, what we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, with the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their, in their midst, he came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirit, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Jesus' authority over the situation, our authority over all the situations in our life, whether it's in thought, in our hearts, emotions, or whether it's in our deeds. It's passing through those filters of uh, all the things that Scripture teaches us about the fruits of the Spirit and when we speak of these things. So we all go through it. It's an exercise. It's getting, getting our, our minds renewed. And when it comes into that place of having that negative report or um, uh, thing that could uh, hurt the temple, so be quiet. Come out. You have authority over your body. You have authority over the situation that, bro dar that darkness brings. Because you are sovereign. You are the temple of God. You belong to God. And I'm just trying to give you some equipping tools as well as myself as we continue to learn. There's earth's evil ruler, which is conflict in the kingdom. Remember a couple of weeks, last week or the week before, I spoke about how uh, there's Jesus and the saints and the demons and the darkness, the devil and the darkness, and, and they're warring against each other. Hence the reason for Ephesians 6. We're starting to understand why it's not against the person, flesh and blood, but it's against what has been brought into that situation, whether it's fear, whether it's a manipulation, whether it's uh, a, a negative report or a false report. For us to appreciate and discern and allow us to come into the right standing with God that allows us to be able to fight our battles. As Jesus confronts Satan, he dramatically exposes the adversary's relationship to this present world. Note the significance in Satan's offer to Jesus of all the kingdoms of the world, where he sees the adversary as administrator of the curse of this planet, a role he has held since man's dom uh, dominion and was lost and forfeited at the fall. Because of this, Jesus does not contest the devil's right to make that offer of this world's kingdom and glory, but he pointedly denied, uh, denies the terms for their being gained. And Jesus knows he is here to regain and ultimately win them. But he will do so on the Father's terms, not the adversaries. Still, the present world system are largely grounded by the limited but powerful and destructive rule of the one Jesus calls the ruler of this world, as found in John Chapter 12, verses 31, and John 14, verses 30. Understanding these facts, we are wise not to attribute to God anything of the disorder of our confused, sin-riddled, diseased, tragedy-ridden, and tormented planet. The present evil age lies under the sway of the wicked one. But Jesus also said that Satan's rule will be cast down, and that he has nothing in me, that is, no control, over Christ, all Christ's own. He who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. There it is right there. There is a confirmation of what I mentioned earlier. That, yeah, I hadn't prepared to read that. That was just something that I wanted to read as I was leading through these scriptures. And that's the confirmation. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Thank you, Jesus. Unlike the other teachers who monotonously quoted from rabbis, Jesus taught with authority, consciousness of his calling, backed by divine display and approval. Then there's the last one that I want to go into. Peter's mother-in-law was cured, plus others at Capernaum. And in Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, It speaks of many being healed in the evening. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served him. 
And when evening came, they brought him, near, uh, brought to him many who were de demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Let's have a look at a biblical uh, ground for divine healing. The provision of divine healing must rest on a clear ground. Obviously, it is biblically, biblically based, but from what sources is this great mercy of God derived? Some link it to just that, God's mercy. Well, that is certainly a truth, for his compassion is great. The question is, uh, at issue is this. What are the redemptive grounds of divine healing? Is healing included in God's saving provision in Christ? Or is it simply a loving gesture of his benevolent character? This text, together with our discussion of Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5, gives clear evidence of divine healing as being provided in the, in the atonement of Christ's redeeming work on the cross. To avoid this truth, some suggest that Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled completely by the healing of that one day. Such would be impossible, for the prophecy of Isaiah states that the servant of Yahweh would bear sickness in the name of in the same way that he would bear sins, that is, voraciously. Furthermore, he is to suffer for our sins and our sicknesses. If our means or all our sins in regard to our sin and our being given a saviour, then it also means all of us in regard to sickness and our having been given a divine healer. We've been given a divine healer to heal us from these things, and it's also something that we can appreciate. And in this message, how she served them, the details emphasized the reality of her healing, and the cure was instantaneous and complete. There were some that Jesus could not heal, but simply that those he did heal were numerous. And the last couple of verses that I want to read to us to, for us today, Luke chapter 4, verses 38 to 41, when he laid hands on them and healed them. And Jesus, with this, spoke of how he would not take testimony from anyone else but our Heavenly Father. As we continue to walk with Jesus and his ministry, let's, let's keep in mind this morning's teachings, as well as all the other teachings, to allow us to appreciate what he's doing in and through our lives. Whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, whether it's the renewing of our mind or whether it's making an impact in the world out there. We all call to do what the Lord has called us to do. But we call to protect his temple and his temple is your body. So my encouragement for you is as you continue with this spiritual eternal journey. Let's be mindful of what we uh, allow into our bodies. Let's be mindful of how we steward uh, the giftings that the Lord gives us and reveals to us as we become closer with Him. And let's see how we can honor one another. Building on that spiritual house from the foundation, building, building, building. But remember, as we spoke about last week, let's be careful how we build so that there's no cracks. And uh, as with Nehemiah, they were able to keep a lookout. Keep a lookout and care for one another whilst they continue to build that wall. So as we build the walls in our, in our spiritual self, let's not build the walls to the detriment of the loving relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father and with others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We ask that you touch the hearts and minds and the spirit of each individual. Touch them, Lord. If there's anything that's not of you that is in their spirit and in their body, we command that they be healed. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill them from the top of their heads to the tip of their toes and that they may be able to be a blessing for others for what you have done for them, regardless of their past, working through their current circumstances to reveal your true nature and your divine eternal purposes for their lives. Help those who hear this message receive receive you be baptized in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and also to help others come into this truth in your heavenly father's name through your son jesus christ we pray 
and all the glory goes to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, sending you all the love in the world. And as we continue, we're going to go deeper and try and find out a little bit more about this, this process of going deeper. Remember the ankles, the knees, the hips? Let's go deeper. So I'm sending you all the love in the world and we'll chat soon.